Hello and welcome to The Pledge. This week, the former French president, Nicolas Sarkozy, was taken into police custody over allegations he accepted money for a political campaign from the former Libyan dictator, Colonel Gaddafi. But it remains a mystery why it took over a decade for him to be questioned about this. If only we had someone around the pledge table who had recently spent a weekend away with him who could enlighten us. So, Nick, how was your weekend with uh, the Sarkozy? <laughs> uh, Dubai, to all of that, is all I'm going to say. <laughs> it was Dubai, was it? It was oh, Dubai. We'll hear a bit more about it later. Coming up on the show this week, Karen believes the threat from Russia means we need to boost defence spending. Michelle says women should be allowed to have children even if they don't have a partner. June thinks social media companies need to regulate themselves and Nick isn't sure about a new anti-terror campaign. But first, it's me. As the only likely perpetrator for the Wiltshire poisonings was the Russian state, we expelled 23 Russian diplomats from London. But then the Russians, who deny responsibility, responded in kind and went further. The ball is now in Theresa May's court, but so far she has resisted striking it back. No new measures have yet been announced. So how can we actually land a punch on Putin? The answer is simple, in the wallet. According to one anti-corruption organisation, of the £4.4 billion worth of UK property brought with suspicious wealth, more than a fifth was purchased by Russians. It's time to hit back where it really hurts and start cleaning house when it comes to the dirty and corrupt Russian cash in the capital. It's time for the government to go after the money. Rachel, um, I totally see where you're going with this, but I don't know how you really implement it in, in yeah. terms of what it would do and the message that it would send to the rest of the world in regards to Britain being a safe place to right. buy property. Um, and also with the Russian wealth, that 4.4, what, what's the figure? 4.4 4 billion. It's tiny in comparison well, the, to the There are other money. figures which suggest that the Russian money in the capital is around 12 billion yeah. as well. But yeah. we don't want to bandy about figures that we can't stand yeah. up. So, so, so where that's concerned, I, I don't know if that's the way to go. And also, that's almost saying that all Russians are the Kremlin, no, and they're not. No, I think the argument is, if I summarise it briefly, mm. um, that if the rich and powerful men, which is at his largely men, yeah. have their transparency, as it were, removed, mm. and uh, there is a, a link transparent to property register of okay. all the properties in London, which there isn't at the moment. No. The government is actually working on, that, on bringing yeah. one in, and I think that they should bring that forward and mm. make... The property register transparent immediately yeah. rather than in 2022 or in whenever it is. But if you the argument is, is that, that Putin's Putin. friends, these are all Putin's friends, probably, which is why they're so rich, which but is why they want a safe haven for their money. Now, I just need to finish the yeah. argument for why we need to go after their money. Yeah. Is they, they will then give Putin a hard time. Yeah. Putin clearly doesn't care if the Foreign Office gives him a hard time. Nick, come on. Well, no, let Karen go because oh, right, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll defer to oh, Karen after you, Karen. Thank you, thank you yeah. Nick. Uh, You've got to keep this all in the overall perspective. Mm. I mean, yeah. where dirty money is concerned, there are estimates could be up to 100 billion pounds yes. worth of dirty money For in Russian the country. Dirty no, 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 all dirty money in the UK. And now, let's all get rid of all no, of it. No, but, yeah. no, but you, to put this in the context, okay. what is what is one of Britain's greatest strengths as an economy? Is that we're an open economy. We're an open economy, and the city we're very well regulated. For example, we have the anti-money laundering law already in existence. So, relatively speaking. We're a clean country in which to do business and, and to invest in, and a very yes. safe. But, yes. again, you put this into context. There's now a new law coming out uh, called the Unexplained Wealth, Wealth Orders. Orders. Yeah. Now, that's going to take... That's already, I, I think, in force now. That gives us even more power yeah. to track down this money. But then look at the number of Russian companies, huge Russian companies that are listed on the London Stock Exchange, over 60 of them. Yeah. We need them to be listed on the London Stock Exchange. Those are big companies. And you know, I think we've got to keep a balance on this. How many Russians live in this country? Yeah. 39,000. It's not, Nothing. not okay. out of 65. Okay, look, I, I agree. Let's explained. do everything with, with. Let me just. Yeah. Say, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Uh, you might have heard of a fellow called Boris Johnson. I don't know yeah. you've heard of him. Sounds He's, Russian. He, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Borisky. It's uh, one of these. He's been talking, and I will explain what unexplained wealth orders are. Let's just hear a little of what the foreign secretary said. If that wealth has been illicitly or corruptly obtained, and we have evidence for that 
then we now have the statute to uh, have an unexplained wealth order against them or to find other means uh, to uh, distract, to deprive them of their assets and to go after them. And for full clarification for the viewers, one of these orders requires a person who is reasonably suspected of involvement in or of being connected to a person involved in serious crime to explain the nature and extent of their interest in particular property and to explain how the property was obtained, whether reasonable grounds to suspect the respondent's known lawfully obtained income would be insufficient to allow the respondent to obtain the property. That was some surprising from the Home Office. Rachel, your plan won't work. Right. Won't work no, 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 I'm no. not... Okay. I'm telling you why it won't work. Just listen to me for one second. Do you honestly think Vladimir Putin, who could could have sanctioned the attempted assassination of people. Do you think he he's gives a damn? He's denied all of it. He's denied it. But he gets, so he, get, he gets a phone call from whoever it might be, Igor. He's like, you're not going to believe this. I've just got a hole in the wall and I can't get my cash out. He'll just laugh. He won't give a flying fig about that. They won't care. And by the way, decent Brits living in Russia, they'll probably have their assets terminated as well. It's ridiculous, I think. No, all I'm saying is, let us go after them within the he law. Won't care. I'm not. If the money is dirty, we can prove it to be dirty, we should get rid of the money and but see where that takes place. But the law is already the there Russian. and we've got even stronger law yeah, that's now come into place. Can we, we should use hear, that can to we its hear? utmost. Oh, got some... I, I think that we just must hear, just to say that people don't actually take Nick seriously, from <coughs> a former Russian leader of the opposition who's in exile called Vladimir. Uh, Vladimir, right, I can't find his surname. Ashurkov. Is that a Russian name? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can't Vladimir, find his surname off. <laughs> Over the last years, Britain has become a haven for dirty money. I think the British authorities can be much more consistent in applying existing legislation against it. The law is there to make Britain much cleaner. It just takes political will to apply it. So, it's, as I said, the government has... Yeah, saying. the government has... But this is what I said, too. Just the government's got to go out... Just put your argument. No. His. That's what I've been saying. And there's a bribery act on top of that, by the way. Well, Our Michelle, bribery act Michelle. is <laughs> even stronger than the American... Um, Foreign yeah. Corrupt Practices Act. Yeah. Uh, we've got a very strong bribery act. We should enforce yeah. our law. We've got a great Absolutely. law in this country. I think we haven't got a scooby what to do about all of this. And I think that we are clutching at straws to think up ways that we could possibly affect um, Putin. I agree I with disagree. you. I think that he will just find it mildly amusing, yeah. Yeah. maybe slightly irritating, but I really don't think he'll actually care. We send diplomats, diplomats back. They close the British Council. They don't really care. So I actually think that instead of quickly knee-jerking and saying, we'll do this, we'll do this, I think we need to press pause and figure out strategically what are we going to do long-term to counter Putin and what he's actually doing. Yeah, because uh, 23, well, what is 23 diplomats and the British Council, by the way, that's bad. Because our culture over there, the amount of great work we do in Russia, and the Russians love it as well. If mm. we do, and they want to learn English. So we do wonderful work there. But again, look at our exports. Do you know how much we export? What proportion of exports Russia is? One percent. One percent. <laughs> yeah. And do you know how much of Russian gas, which a lot of European countries yes, are very dependent, dependent but do you know how, on, no, but yeah. how much we're not? Only we're about not, one percent yeah. of Russian gas ends up over yeah. here. So we're in actually a very strong position mm. to take a good principal stance on this. Rachel, can I bring yes. in a video from yes, Robert do. Barrington, who's the yeah. Executive Director of Transparency International UK, in regards to the dirty money and how much of it is actually Russian? We've got some estimates of the dirty money, um, money that are the proceeds of corruption or other illicit money, and it's estimated, estimated by the National Crime Agency to be around 100 billion a year in total, of which possibly a quarter is from Russia. Yeah, so in terms of seizing assets, that's tiny in comparison to how much dirty money there is. I, I don't think this is the way to go. And also, I'm not sure going after Russian people is the route. No. We need to figure out how we go after Putin and the Kremlin. Do you think we should do more stuff until it's been conclusively proven that this was... A Russian yes. attack. Yeah, because even when it's proven by we the independent yeah. organisation, the Russians will still say it's not there. Deny, mm. yeah. I, think, I think in this, actually, and I'm going to say, I think both Boris Johnson and I think Mrs May have played very, very well. There was perhaps a slight misspeak about the, the, the Berlin Olympics, mm. 1930s. That was a bit of an error. But apart from that, because the, even, even if they're handed incontrovertible evidence, Michelle, they'll still say it's not yeah. us. And, and you yeah. know what's, what the difference over here is? Where people say we're going back to a Cold War situation. Mm. Well, in the Cold War, the whole of the West was united yes. against mm. Russia. Yes. Now we're trying to get everyone to unite, including the European Union, mm -hmm. NATO, well, and people are falling in line. So I think once the world unites, okay, it may go back to a Cold War-type confrontation, 
But that is much more powerful than Britain taking any unilateral, though we should. I mean, we should make the mm -hmm. point, and we have done it in a very principled way, but it's that united front globally that will have the effect on Russia. I think so Theresa, May, Theresa <laughs> May is in Brussels today yeah. trying to drum up a kind of united front. And, yeah. I mean, Karen, do you think that the, the fact that we're leaving the EU means that we don't have the, the stronger... the alliance that we had with our I European partners, or do you right. think that oh. on Russia Don't we are as united? Brexit. No, I'm not making it about <laughs> Brexit. Making a valid I, but is it, is it sensible no. even to pick a fight with Putin's no. cronies? I'm arguing against myself now. Is it a mistake to make pick a fight <laughs> even against Putin's cronies when before, we're leaving the well, EU? Well, before we get into a huge debate about the EU, and I agree with you there, I think I agree, yeah. leaving the EU makes Britain more isolated. It does. And if we're with the EU, a united voice is much stronger than an isolated I've voice. Heard of NATO. And, so, and let us move on, though. We'll have to move on yes, to, to we could carry on that discussion <laughs> and i'm yes, with you uh, the number one responsibility of any government is the security of its citizens but since 2010 our armed forces have been significantly cut the british army strength is now below 80,000. that is the smallest it has been since the napoleonic wars 200 years ago the attack in salisbury has highlighted what a dangerous world we now live in and we have to be able to defend ourselves from the threats posed by the likes of Russia. Countering terror and cyber war is important, but you still need a critical mass of boots on the ground. We need hard power to support the soft power we have in abundance. So it's time to increase our spending on traditional defense. Without it, we can't keep our people safe. Um, Karen, I know you're from a traditional um, military family, etc., but I disagree with you um, in the sense of the answer to this threat is boots on the ground. And I think if that's our objective, we're going to be an awful long time trying to achieve that because if we actually look at the might of boots on the ground, traditional military, Russia versus the UK, just some basic stats, tanks, we've got 400-odd 400, 400 tanks, they've got 20-odd thousand, 157 military personnel, us, they've got 770-odd military per thousand military personnel. If we try and win this war with Russia based on boots on the ground, it's not going to happen. I think we should absolutely be increasing defence spending to keep us safe, but um, Nicholas Carter, what he was saying is that the threat the from chief Russia... Of the, chief of the British Army. Yeah, Chief of Staff. He was saying, actually, it's not just about weapons that go bang from Russia, it's about exploitation of energy, bribery, corruption, mm -hmm. cyber, cyber attacks, assass assass yeah. assassinations. Yeah. And I agree with him. And actually, what I would like to see is we're pushing NATO members... I would argue that actually we should be pushing more NATO members to commit to their 2% of spending so that actually we can increase our collective NATO strength, including military personnel, and use that if we need to against Russia. Because at the moment, there's only five, five countries paying their 2% of which we are one of them. And I think that is absolutely wrong. So I'm, so I'm not saying it's an either or situation. We need to be doing all those things that you've just said. But to have an army that is so small now, the smallest in 200 years, that cannot even fill Wembley Stadium, I think is shocking. You speak to any senior armed, armed forces, general, admiral, air marshal, they will all say this is really dangerous because you need a certain critical mass to be able to just react. We can't stand up to Russia on our own. But why They're many we not times our bigger. We're in NATO. We're in NATO, but we're one of the most powerful members of NATO. And Britain is a global power, and we need that critical mass. And 80,000 80, is you know, tiny. You saying we're diminishing on the world stage. We are. We now are. suddenly we're you know, a global we power. We are still. We haven't <laughs> left the European <laughs> Union yet. We haven't left yet. But by, the way, I, by the way, I'm actually finding myself conflicted here, because, yes, I do think we need some more boots on the ground. I don't think there's any point us trying to match, flex our muscle against Russia. Yeah. But I mean, you, you, boots on the ground. Witness the events we saw in Salisbury. But what, what, how would... How would more boots on the ground help prevent a Salisbury? Well, do you know how the army actually has helped out there? The army in any crisis situation, the whether it's the Olympics, the no, whether it's the Olympics, the army has to, has to step in. Whether it's firefighters, sometimes yeah, no, if there was a strike, the army stepped in. Prevent. So domestically, how can and, it prevent? And, no, and also with, it's not just pre prevention; it's reaction to a situation as well. well. Things happen without warning, and suddenly in another part of the world where we have to send our forces. No, I agree. And, I agree. And, and, and we need the critical mass to do that. Karen, don't you think it's not just about 
spending more money. It's how do you encourage young people to even want to join our armed There's a recruitment forces. problem. You're absolutely right, you. You know, they're, surely... we're reliant on reserves at the moment. Yeah. And they can't even... Re we're way behind the target in recruiting our reserves. And we totally. shouldn't rely on reserves for full-time troops. So surely we need to focus on that. And that's not necessarily spending more money. That's actually coming up with a comprehensive plan, isn't it? Well, it is, it is also about money in total. I mean, mm -hmm. we've got huge billions allocated 170 billion over the next 10 years in equipment. Mm -hmm. Things like our fighters yeah. or the nuclear submarines, mm -hmm. which we have to do as well. That's a huge deterrent power that we have. Mm -hmm. But again, I keep going back to this. Without the number of troops, mm -hmm. without that critical mass, a fighting formation. I mean, when my father was commander-in-chief of the Central Army in India, he had 350,000 troops under his command. But we've only got 80,000 of our whole British but, Army. But NATO has got 3 million military personnel. But that includes to, the United States of America, predominantly. Yeah, That's compared a big to chunk of it. 800 and odd thousand that Russia's got. With the but remember, leadership. NATO is not just Russia. The threats looking ahead is also countries like China. China's got a very powerful military. NATO has to operate worldwide, not just in the European theater. I think that I thought Michelle's summary was excellent yeah. about, uh, in response to your call for more boots on the ground. And I think that she mentioned what Nick Carter, the chief of general staff, said. And the truth is, is that it's far more complex than just yeah. putting boots on the ground so now. Let's... And, you know, we've got Russia but making incursions into Ukraine. Yes. And let's hear what Stoltenberg said about that. But we've also got cyber attacks and we've got potential... Yeah. 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 Well, I'm going to cue him in. Okay. And we've also got potential, um, you know, dirty money and poisoning. You know, yes. it's an so it, it's, And what they now call things. this is hybrid warfare. But oh. let's look at the actual yeah. amount of money that's been oh. cut. Oh. We've, we've been cut. From, from 36.4 billion to 35.3 billion in five years. When we should be increasing, the threat around the world is increasing and we're cutting. And the number of armed forces personnel has fallen by 36% over the last 13 years. I we mean, need this, to look at when the, the world why. is getting more dangerous, yeah. we're actually, cutting. If you look at the numbers for forward defense spending, they are in hundreds of billions, but we must now hear from Jan Stoltenberg. We have seen Russia's uh, continued uh, uh, efforts to uh, destabilize eastern Ukraine and we have seen uh, that Russia continues uh, to interfere in our democratic uh, political uh, processes. Uh, we have seen different um, types of hybrid tactics. Sorry, that was the NATO Secretary General, obviously, who's basically summarizing the change in our relationship with Russia, which is that they've gone from being a strategic partner to what is yeah, called yesterday a strategic yeah. Enemy. Yeah. Look, look at the Russian might. Yeah. If you just look at the might of the Russian army, yes, yes. I mean, there's a review of, of Putin reviewing um, his troops, and you, and you just look at this demonstration of force. Yes. Um, it, it makes what Kim Jong does in North Korea look like a little and dinky so toy. Very um, difficult for us to play catch up. And, See, and look I, at this. I agree with you, and I agree with Michelle, because yes, we probably do need more boots on the ground. Not perhaps the number you say. Yes, we do need to fight cyber war. Where are you going to take the money from? Health? Yeah. Well, education. So defen defense of the, the, the defense <laughs> of our country. By the way, if you look at our priorities, defense is the third biggest expenditure yeah. item in our budget. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it is the third biggest, without a doubt. But as a priority, what is the number one priority of a country, of a the government, defense. is the safety defense of its citizens. So you are going to take money from education. It will not be necessarily taking money from where education. Where? Where? No, 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 no. It's the fourth biggest spending. It, at okay, the moment, but it's isn't it? third it's, or fourth the biggest. Fourth. Third or fourth, whichever way you look at it, whether you lump certain things Don't together. Where is it coming from? But you have to. You have to make that priority. You haven't said have where the money is going to come yeah. from. Where the money is going to come from? We're going to requisition all the different <laughs> money in the capital, and it's going to go. That's into still not on enough. The that's money, still money not is enough. going to come from a, a government that's doing so well that it's reducing the deficit and increasing the money so that can be spent know. on on all areas. You don't know. No, we have Lord, to find the money. We <laughs> have to find the money, and it's a question of prioritization. We have to find this money because it's the more important priority. The more important priority, I think, the most important priority is the safety of us citizens and the world is getting far too dangerous on every level but you don't just protect the citizens by boots on the ground we've just been talking about the the poisoning that wouldn't have affected it. and then when we said about the poisoning you countered that by saying about when the army stepped in in the olympics Look how long you know the army stepped in to um mop up a failed um operation from a private security company that's not the purpose of an army i don't want military personnel hanging around to mop no, up... No, they also yeah. were on the streets after the Westminster attack. Yeah. No, we're talking we are, about the Olympics. so many stages. I gave, the, I, gave, I gave the example of firefighters going on strike, the army stepped in. Over here, the army stepped in. The Olympics, the army stepped in. 9-11, God forbid something like that happens, 
who rushed but, off to Afghanistan, but, but our army. So you know, then they've got all those well, we military are part personnel. Of, we are part of NATO. It, it, we but, are a critical part of it, and we should see ourselves as a leader on the global stage where this counts. And our contribution to the United Nations forces. And then, don't you agree with forces, me then that we should be putting pressure on people to actually step up and commit to their two percent, without a doubt, like us? Without a actually, doubt. Actually, you can use that I, money. Absolutely. To fund. Absolutely. No, no, no. I absolutely agree with that as well. And by the way, I didn't. The point I was making is not just boots on the ground. I'm talking about overall defence expenditure. Germany, for example, which is very important expenditure. if Russia does become more active. And, and this is not just, I mean, if you look at mm. the people who speak out are the retired generals, the ones who've just retired. Why is it they all sit as on the way out? couldn't speak yes, when they were when, serving. When they were there. Why yes. didn't they sit while they're in office? Yeah, because they're trained, they're military blokes. They, 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 they are, they're in a hole. They fight look at the our way, Navy. that's the way they're trained. You know, look at our Navy. Yeah. We've got 70, 73 ships afloat, which includes little boats. I mean, this was Britannia rules the waves. Yeah, we were, Where are we, we today? The best. It is shocking. Right. Anyway, moving swiftly on. Um, maybe I've watched one too many Disney movies, but I believe in the fairy tale. Two people meet, fall madly in love, get married, have babies, and live happily ever after. Sadly, it seems said fairy tale is happening less and less. More women are finding themselves approaching the end of their 30s without a relationship in sight. Those who are maternal are forced to make a choice. Forget your dreams of being a mum, freeze your eggs and hope for the best, or go it alone, have IVF and become a single mum by choice. Those of us who opt for the latter, for grabbing the last chance of motherhood, are often regarded as selfish or as making a lifestyle choice. For me, it is neither. The NHS helps couples conceive where they can't do it naturally. If they're choosing to do so, it is time for them to extend that help to people who have been forced to go it alone. Oh, I really wish I wasn't picking up on this because I think this is so complicated, it's so messy, it's so emotional and it really it's about the NHS resources as against a woman's wish to have a baby and those two things don't always fit together. Um, as we were talking earlier in the defence spending um, section, you know, we do not have unlimited resources and uh, healthcare, like politics, is all about choices. However, I think your argument is that a single woman has as much right to uh, NH IVF on the NHS as a couple. And I think I agree with you. I think that the, I, we live in a very coupled up world, but I don't think that only couples should have recourse to the state healthcare system to achieve their dreams. But I think it has to be within limits. Because so, these, I, I know as speaking as a mother myself that baby hunger is one of the strongest urges a woman deals with in her whole life. And I have full sympathy for women who, who want to achieve mm. motherhood mm. Uh, on the NHS. There are also other methods available such as fostering and adoption but i completely understand and hear you but i think there have to be limits nick's gonna blow a gasket well, I'm not because i'm uniquely unqualified to speak on this yeah. because a i'm a bloke and b i've successfully had two children by normal yeah. methods so i'm very very blessed but to brutally sub down what you're saying mm -hmm. you're saying that a single woman's right to have ibf when it's a right to have a baby no it's, she it, didn't i thought it's that's what not she said, a right she's not no. saying that. so let me be absolutely yeah. clear so what right. i'm what i'm not suggesting is that the nhs has to fund ivf because it's a right to have a baby you're not saying i'm not that. saying no, that right. so it goes without saying that if you've got two cases you've got a child with leukemia or you've got a 30 year old woman that wants an IVF, who should get that priority of funding? It goes without saying it should be the child with but. leukemia. So I'm not talking about priority of spending. What I'm talking about is if and where the NHS had made the decision that they will fund IVF, then what I'm saying is they have to, if they're making that choice to fund IVF for a couple that can't conceive, they have to equally treat a single woman in the okay. same way, and that they don't. Be, there will be many people watching this who are lone parents, probably single mums. Mm -hmm. They might have been widowed, marriages might have come to an end, partners might have walked out, yep. and good luck to them. And I don't want to do them a disservice. 
but you wouldn't want to necessarily bring in children with lone parents, would you? Absolutely. Okay. You. Well, uh, well, I think I am qualified to speak yeah, on this issue because I am a woman that has recently just left her 30s and doesn't have children. Mm -hmm. And I totally disagree with you on this one, Michelle, for a number of reasons. First part is, for the, N the NHS offers this service for those that can't afford to pay for it privately mm -hmm. in the way that a you or I can. Mm -hmm. Is it means and tested, Ivia? It's not means tested, but if you can afford it, you would go yeah, private. I wouldn't it's quicker. Need the NHS for yeah, it. Right. because okay. if you're because time is of the essence where yeah. IVF is concerned. Just to, on a point of clarification, with regards to the NHS, they don't actually choose how to fund it. It's, it's determined by different local areas. Yes, and local exactly. Postcode yeah. lottery. Yeah, yeah. Just, just to go, yeah. yeah. June. Sorry. So, so my point is. Back to a, a sort of a Nick Ferrari point, we cannot afford to fund everybody. Yeah. And chances are, if you are a single mother that cannot afford IVF, then you are on a lower income anyway. So we have to look at that. What is the, what is the income that that single woman has versus the income of yeah. two couples, let's say, of, a, of two people, of a couple? And then the other piece is... At some point, we have to draw the line. Not everybody gets to have kids. It's not nice, it's not great, yeah. but it's yeah. real life. Yeah. And, and, at, and also the thing to add to this is, IVF for a single woman costs more than IVF for a couple because you also have to factor in a sperm bank and all of the issues that you deal with there first. So for me, I think this is nice, it's a nice idea, but sorry, I completely disagree um, with it. You, that, well, that Again, you look at how many people are we talking about? We're mm. talking about 1,400 people, 1,300 people a year. It depends where you take that, the biggest That one. is a, a year in the whole of the mm. UK. But the principle of it is what you're, what you're saying. And I mean, how many? We all know people, including members of our family, mm. who've struggled to have children, who've gone through IVF. Yeah. Uh, it's a very emotional, yeah. painful, um, and, and, and very Stressful. sad story. A lot of yeah. them, it very often doesn't succeed. Yeah. People also, we must remember, are so will will go to any lengths. They will go abroad. Mm -hmm. They will they go to yeah. they'll go to India. They'll go to European countries, to where they, you have IVF treatment. For example, over here. Yeah. So and and what Nick mentioned, it's not the same all over the country. No. The, some of our health authorities don't offer it no. at all. At all, yeah. Uh, others will insist that you have to try artificial insemination ten or twelve times. Then you're yeah. entitled to IVF. So it's lots of hurdles people have to go through. People will go to any lengths, and I completely understand that. And and I personally feel if, if a single mother wants to have a child and can't, then we should be able to support okay, that so if at all possible. The question seems to boil down to, um, should a single woman have the same right as a couple if they present to their hospital where they actually offer this treatment on the NHS? Richard. Hands up who thinks they should. Richard. Richard. And just to just be clear, no. by the way, I don't no. see having children you as do, a right. I, I see it no, as a privilege. Not, yeah. But I see it as a privilege that shouldn't just be afforded to a couple. But so I, to your but, point... But, 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 but my point is, it's not the same because the procedure is different for a single woman versus a couple. There's an added extra piece to it. Well, wait, what it. if one we, couple pre presents once IVF because the man's... Sperm doesn't work, then it's the same, isn't well, it? Well, then, yeah, so then, 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 then your point is valid there, then, yeah. because you're adding that extra cost. So, so then, I would be can't. fine for them not to do that. But to me, what and I'm arguing... And would you offer this to men? OK, what about single men who want to have kids? What I'm arguing... No, but, what but I'm, I'm arguing... asking. <laughs> but I'm asking. What I'm arguing <laughs> is about uniformity of the policy. So, um, and there'll be loads of people screaming at their sets going, we shouldn't be funding IVF at all. And that is a separate debate, because what I'm saying is where you've chosen to fund IVF, I do not think yeah. you should say to a single person, you can't do this because you don't have a partner. So even just looking at Twitter before this debate, I was shocked at how many people were saying, you just you prioritize your career you don't look you can't be bothered to find a man you're lazy why don't you get a cat why don't you get a dog you got my All messages these things. <laughs> <laughs> was it you reply i i truly feel like this being in the situation that i'm in is horrible yeah, no, you and also i want this to agree yes, i'm not arguing nick. about myself i can afford but, uh, it uh, i'm defending other people Michelle, that can we've got to pick up on nick because i think <laughs> nick's one of these people who thinks that tom daly and his partner shouldn't have a baby you don't think but you that. do you not recognize wait but do you not recognize that families I know this sounds like a, 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 a navet. Come in all shapes and sizes. Of course now. they do. Of course it's course not they just do. a man and a woman having two of nuclear children. Cool. Right. In which case, why can't Michelle have a IVF on the NHS? So yeah. Because I think I think actually from the debate June made one of the most telling points, which is 
in probably, if this woman is going to be at the lower end of the earning it's cycles... It's all about money, is it? Uh, yes. Well, no, but yes. Often, she can't afford... Yeah, she can't maybe not afford for you your privileged she shouldn't background, have a baby but for a lot of people chest. out there, it is about money, actually. that's shocking, actually. It is about I money. Then if shocking. it is about money, but if it is it's about money... It's an exclusion money, on the no, grounds of poverty. No, no, but you see, if it is about money, all the more we should help somebody like that who so wants to have a child for all the right reasons, uh, we should be able to help. might to make a much angry. better mother than a than no, a woman who's got four is, children is, is and lets the nanny no. look up. Do I get a word in? No. Who's then going to who's then going to struggle to bring the child up? No, I'm sorry. But like, it will I'm financially. Sorry. No, 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 no. You don't know that. So you're saying that's couple, so prejudiced against single mothers. But you're saying a couple mothers, can have IVF, but because a single person wants to use the NHS, they therefore can't afford it. Well, you're no, saying that a couple. No, can that's have... not what I'm saying. I don't. Anyway. But we'll just have to agree to disagree on this one. So you wouldn't have a baby as a single mother? I wouldn't, but I'm not against anybody but else doing it. you frozen your eggs, is yeah. that for when you're coupled up? Exactly. Right. But I'm Why did you look at me, then? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool your eggs for me. <laughs> but I'm not against anybody else doing okay. it. So. And it's yeah. a hard decision If you can make. afford and it. And it's a hard life to oh choose. Boy. Absolutely. <laughs> and that's why I'm saying don't add further complexity, complexity to it by not even helping those people along the way. OK, anyway. Coming up after the break, I'll be giving social media companies a good telling off. The reports this week about the activities of Cambridge Analytica, the analysis firm which harvested the data of 50 million Facebook users, has shown how vulnerable our democracies are to subversion through social media. Sites such as Facebook have the potential to become unwitting allies in the spread of misinformation and mass manipulation, and it is damaging our democratic processes. Up to now, social media giants have been resistant to government, media and public pressure to change, but not just on data, but on issues like extreme content and tax too. But now they have to act. They have to act urgently to regulate themselves and regulate who can access the data of their users and what content is put out. If they don't, governments will have to. But without the tech know-how of the companies themselves, Government regulation will probably be clumsy and will inevitably detract from the freedom that the users of social media currently enjoy. So in the interests of us remaining a free society, these tech companies need to step up and use their ingenuity to protect our data and our democracy. Well, before any of my learned friends reach for their pencils and uh, <laughs> save them sending in letters, let's just say what the two companies that get key to this say. Cambridge Analytica, we entirely refute any allegation that Cambridge Analytica or any of its affiliates use entrapment bribes or so-called honey traps for yeah. any purpose whatsoever. We routinely undertake con conversations with prospective clients to try and tease out any unethical or illegal intentions. And to Facebook, which we're also to talk about, Mark Zuckerberg, of course, founder and CEO, has said, we have a responsibility to protect your data, and if we can't, then we don't deserve to serve you. I've been working, he says, to understand exactly what happened, how to make sure it does not happen again. The good news is the most important actions to prevent this from happening again today, we've already taken years ago, but we made mistakes. There's more to do. Mm. We need to step up and do it. So that's all safely parked. Right, June. Yeah. How funny, then. How funny that as a result of the Trump victory, suddenly we're concerned about that. Because, June, you are a Brexit-hating, Obama-loving, yeah. plebiscite-loathing lovey. Oh, yeah. If this had gone the other way, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have given a, damn, given a damn about it. But can I refer you? Can I indeed... Not at all. Can I put forward... Can I put... They can... swung the elections for Brexit. <laughs> no, 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 Cambridge Analytica also worked for Ted Cruz. And look what a smash hit his campaign was. But can I present to the court, please, evidence from the paper that I read regularly, The Guardian, February 2012. Hmm. February 2012. When I read, and I read, that Team Obama are building a vast digital data operation for the first time combining a unified database on millions of Americans they didn't using steal Facebook the data. to target individual voters to a degree never achieved oh. before. Facebook is seen as a source of invaluable data on voters. The re-election team, Obama for America, will invite its supporters, and on and on and on. They were doing it many years ago. Point? The truth of the matter was that, that Trump point? was more successful. What's this your point? Forever. This has happened for... There's, no, there's, there's no, nothing no, to no, see. No, 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 no,
For starters, the data wasn't stolen in the yeah. Obama campaign. It wasn't scraped from everyone's no, friends' profiles. Exactly. Which and, they did. and the difference is the people that were the data that was mined here, the those that the data that was used, the majority of those people had no idea that their data was well, being made. And also please in that there's a very important point here. Very important point here. 2012. Let's keep this in perspective. Yeah. Do you know when Facebook was founded? Zuckerberg himself just said, oh, 14 years ago, 14, 2004, 14 years ago, I didn't think we'd be in this position where yeah. we'd have to consider all these things. Yeah. This revolution has happened at the speed of light. Yeah. In the six years since what you quoted, look how far things have come. Cool. We are now waking up. Do you know what the, you know what the big four are called? They're called fangs. Yeah. Facebook, Amazon, yeah. Netflix, and Google. and Google. Do you know what their values are? Facebook over 500 billion, yeah. together trillions. These are so powerful now. They've just grown into these mammoths. And now we've got to stop. And what they're not doing is they're not investing in their integrity. No. What people are now saying is not Silicon Valley, it's Silicon Valley. <laughs> that, precisely. So we've got to be very careful. This is something that's really good for the world, really good for business, really good for consumers, but it's got a very Where's dark side. Where's the evidence, no, no, no. Where's what, the evidence what, they've done anything wrong? The number one thing that was trending last week was delete Oh, my Facebook. God, because no, of but, trending. No, let me finish. My point is, so why I'm saying that they need to self-regulate yes. is because what's happened now is up until this point, the public still has had a blind trust in these companies. Yes. What's happening now is they're losing public trust. But where's the evidence they've done anything because, wrong? Well, they have done something wrong in well, that they allow no data I mean, look at, look at to be YouTube. used How in the way that How many films are still on YouTube, owned by Google? How much is on there that is dreadful stuff that shouldn't be there? They are making so much money now. It is their responsibility to invest in policing yeah. their but sites. The, it the is their responsibility to do it. We've got to yeah. make sure... But the mistrust, the, the mistrust that the public have in them now is what could bring those companies okay. down. I, 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 think it's, video. I think that what we see here is that it's hard to know whether to overreact to yeah. what's happened mm. with Facebook well, we have to or underreact things. to what's happened with Facebook and the facts are is that Facebook has got two billion users it's a, it's not a company mm. it's a country yeah I mean China's country. got 1.4 billion <laughs> uh, population yeah. Facebook is bigger yeah. than China yeah. therefore it behoves Facebook to behave incredibly responsibly but the question Nick's question is also pertinent mm. to what extent can we prove the fact that these people who were targeted with these ads or who were exposed to these ads actually voted a certain way and you know what's and going to come out this weekend what? this weekend is probably going to come out about the whole impact that this has had on Brexit there we go well, that's, 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 what that's what going to happen this weekend but before, You've got no evidence just wait and see no, wait, so wait and see we, what comes out can we hear what what's the, the best I think I think we do need to take this seriously and uh, Elizabeth Denham the information commission is incensed. Have a look at what she has to say. My fining power is up to £500,000. Um, that's not a great deal of money. It's not, it's not a, a disincentive for, for some organisations. But as of May, my fining power will be up to 4% of a company's global turnover. So much more significant powers. Yes, so I think these companies are going to start taking this stuff very seriously. Michelle, you're the tech genius amongst us. What do you think? Right, I feel I need to make my first points counter your stuff about manipulation and Brexit. Why and do democracy. you have to counter everything? Why is it I always say? Brexit? Why do you not agree I, with feel, me? I feel you're the wrong. need. <laughs> I do feel the need. So there was actually a study done um, in November 2017 which looked at 22.6 million tweets during a period um, that the US Senate had identified. 450 of them were. 400 yeah. were potentially, potentially a bit dodgy. Now, 400 tweets out of 20 odd million, I can safely say, and you know, I may be proved wrong in time, I'm not actually sure that Brexit was achieved by. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. so let, just before but we anyway, even talk about. Yes, you want to say something? But my, my broader point, mm. which is about data and the use of data. Mm. What's gone on here is that we have been a nation of naive customers. Yes. Because you must make no doubt that we're not users of platforms mm. such as Facebook, etc. We are customers mm. of people like Facebook. And data, when you consider Facebook, data is its blood, its bones, its oxygen. It's how it creates its value. It's how it makes its revenue. And when you talk about mass manipulation, mm. manipulation to the public has gone on pretty much forever. If you pick up a newspaper, mm. you journalists, you're trying to persuade the reader of that use, uh, newspaper to follow your agenda. If you, if you let every newspaper out on a table and read a story, the story is presented differently depending on which publication it is presented within. 
advertisers for decades and longer have been trying to manipulate consumers to purchase them pr and prefer their products. So what we're so saying what is that we, they now, don't have to take any responsibility? No, where we are now today is we are hyper-sophisticated, we have big data, it allows, it allows businesses, for example, to efficiently target consumers to the nth degree. Which is why, no, which is why, which is why, if I may, which, we're which is they why, have to be responsible. Which, which is why that we are moving with the times. We've had the Data Protection Act for a long time. Yeah. That is now completely yeah. outdated. Yeah, yeah. So now yeah. we're we bringing out GDPR, GDPR, which is coming out in May, the General yeah. Data Protection yeah. Regulation, which is an EU regulation, by the way. A lot of them are actually yeah. very good. And we're and also this following one is going to, This one is going to give us much more control of the consumer. We have power over our data. It I'm belongs to us. And I think that's really important that we have this now. Just need to clarify. I agree. We're not suggesting that I agree Facebook, with you on something. No. Just need to clarify that we're not suggesting Facebook mm. has manipulated any data. No, Quick no, point no. before I throw it back. Can you and my learned lord here yes. just accept that there was no manipulation? People perhaps wanted President Trump and people wanted Brexit, and that's the reality of it. It might not be the way you wanted, but bad luck, no, but you lost and they that, won. No, 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 What's no. next? Nick. For me, the actual outcome of the election is not the point. Can I? Can we hear what Christopher Wiley actually said in answer to your yes, point that it was on. all just the people's will? They weren't influenced by anybody else. They weren't. Influenced this is by... a whistleblower. Yeah, let's hear from Christopher Wiley, the whistleblower from Cambridge from Analytica. This is based on this on an idea called informational dominance, which is the idea that if you can capture every channel of information around a person and then inject content around them, you can change the perception of what's actually happening. So they thought they wanted Brexit and Trump, but in fact they were told to want Brexit I, I and Trump. I say to you what I said, where's the evidence? No, 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 but Nick, where's... Nick for me, the, the outcome of the election is not the point. The point is, out of those 50 million people, the vast majority did not sign up to this. Use one of Karen's expression, fangs for that debate. <laughs> but we move on, and you're watching the pledge on Sky News. After the break, I'm skeptical about another anti terror campaign. This week, we were all urged to become counter-terrorism citizens. And while I'd urge you to go to the phone instantly and share with authorities any concerns you have about any suspicious behaviour, am I the only one to question this scheme's worth? A brief look at the case of Ahmed Hassan, the Parsons Green Tube Bomber, whose murderous intent was only foiled due to his blessed utter incompetence, is enough to cause concern. Vile Hassan arrived in this country aged 16, hiding in the back of a truck. He'd been orphaned by the war in Iraq. Shortly after his arrival, he told Home Office, Home Office officials he'd been recruited by the Islamic State group and had been trained to kill. He was referred to the Anti-Terror Prevent Programme. But after just a week, was judged, quotes, no cause for concern. Mercifully, no one was killed by his makeshift bomb, though 30 people were injured. Now, if we can't pick up someone like Hassan, what is the point of an initiative like this? If police get tip-offs, they have to act on them. Uh, Nick, this is such an important area and that we are living in a world and in a country where sadly things are getting more and more dangerous. Mm. And what's the irony of it all? Since Theresa May became Home Secretary in 2010, what has happened to our police force? While the world has got more and more dangerous, we've cut our police force. The funding has been cut by almost 20 percent. The number of in police, in re and, uh, absolutely, and the, uh, where it should be increasing to cope with the problems we have. Mm. What about the, the bobby on the street, visible policing, which has always been the number of police stations that have been shut down, including my local police station. And mine, yeah. Neighborhood policing, mm -hmm. which is so important. That's where they pick up information. Yeah. That's where they hear things from the people on the street. That's when they spot things has been cut. Over 20,000 our police force have been cut. And on top of that, armed policing has gone down by over 1,000 when armed policing should be increased. Sadly, this week, we're remembering what happened at Westminster. I was trapped yeah. in there for, yeah. for the you know, hours and hours, and sadly, PC Keith Palmer died yeah. trying to protect as, us. As did other innocent and, citizens. And our other, other citizens were killed that day. And mm. armed policing is required more than ever. If there, were, if there were an armed guards at that place, if he was armed, the terrorists would have died, not PC Keith Palmer. Mm. So I think we have been negligent as a country, negligent 
in terms of cutting our police force. And that is the core problem over here. Yes, of course, the public have got to be vigilant. Yeah. No question about it. And what the police say is about 20% of what is reported by suspicious people being suspicious yeah. is actually turns out yes. to be something genuinely dangerous. Yeah. So I'm all for that. But the core problem is we've cut our police force. That's negligent. I I'll... completely disagree with you. Sure. Sorry, I am trying You're to... disagree with me again. Yeah, yeah, I am trying to find something to agree with you on. I don't think that we're going to stop terrorism by having Bobby's on the street. I don't. Where I'm from, you have something called a grasser, and if you're seen talking to a bobby on the beat about the bloke down the road, it's probably not going to end very well. So actually, I people applaud... Are, people are brave and they do it. Believe no, I me, they get so much. Do you know how much most crimes, no, most homicide is solved through information, no, through information you get on the ground? I applaud... If you see someone buying enormous amounts of chemicals or hiring a truck, yeah. that's not a grass, is no, it? No, of course not, but they're not, gonna, they're not going to. I completely applaud these mechanisms for people, so I, I also disagree with you. Okay. Because I think that we should be vigilant citizens. I think that we should be helping the police in their thing. And actually, I think that what we need is these prevent strategies, the mechanisms to report that I've seen this person doing something a bit dodged, whether it's buying all this yes. stuff or doing this stuff. But we didn't so work with Parsons Green bloke. If, no. if we find someone like that, we've well, got you, to take action. What fills me with absolute dread is the amount of people who are deemed to be at a risk, a terrorism at risk, that are wandering the streets. Well, they're being watched. I think wandering the streets. They are being monitored in the most cases. Well, let's bring other, let, yes. let's bring other okay. people in. I will come... June. Yeah, well, I'm really surprised, Nick, that you're so passionately against this measure. I would have thought that this would be the sort of thing that you'd be in favour of. Only if they follow it up, but go back to you. Yeah, yeah so um, back to what Karen was saying in terms of the stats, I've got a stat that I'd like to bring up, um, which is uh, uh, in 2017, there were 30,984 um, calls made uh, to the counter-terror unit. 21.5% of them actually helped with live investigations. Yeah, yeah. So this stuff works. And also, I've heard you many times on this show be in favour of the Bobby on the Beat I because am. of local policing. No. How is this just not a national no, version of no, that? No, I, 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 I've clearly not represented myself very no. well, and I know you want to come back. <laughs> of course people should phone in with tips. Okay. But as and when they are then, they go off, these people must get proper terms. They must act. They so must, you're saying, which is what okay. happen so with you're the Parsons saying Green you bloke. agree with it, you're no, just saying you want to see follow through. Information, okay. which you clearly didn't okay. with Parsons Green. Nick, Rachel Johnson. I think it's given what we talked about earlier with the new Ru security threat from Russian. I think it's actually behoves all of us yeah. to be citizen um, policemen or whatever, anti-terror citizens. The prevent program doesn't work. Uh, clearly. No, well, Wick, read the Parsons Green bomber. This is what the security minister says. I welcome the conviction of Hassan, who sought to spread terror in this country and murder innocent people. It is clear that there are some lessons to be learned in this particular case. Police and local council have conducted an, an internal review into how it was handled, and we are working with our partners to review the findings and to interview where further improvements can be made. To identify where further... That's Ben Wallace. Yeah, ben yeah, Wallace yeah, from the Home Office. Yeah. I mean, actually, there was a story this morning where if you do ring 999 to report, you can take from one yeah, hour to 15 hours. That was shocking. That was shocking. 15 oh, hours for your... But we your forget, you know, look at initiatives that have been around for many years, like Crime Stoppers, mm. where you can and phone in anonymously yeah. yes. and report a crime. And that has been seen to be very, very effective very over effective, the years. Yeah. With the prevent strategy, it's a good idea. It's not working, Karen. But the reality is so many of the people are radicalised. When they go into prison, they get radicalised. Even yeah. more so. When they come back, and it's very difficult to de-radicalise somebody who is an IS fanatic, yeah. for example. And that's, been, that's the challenge. It is so difficult to do this. But we someone's... need prevent, but we also need the ability for people to be able to anonymously, whether it's through Crime yes. Stoppers, whether it's whichever way they do it, but for 999 not to respond for over a day, for you not to say for you to say not that prevents not working and it's been useless, but actually to encourage communities yeah. to call out the people they suspect of in course. their communities. But and we know what we're talking about when it comes to Islamic terrorism. But if a bloke is on his way for an interview to a Home Office official and he says, I've been trained to kill and I'm a fan of IS and we still don't take action, what is the point of all these initiatives? I but agree, Crime Stoppers has been... But how can you use one example to say when we've shown that 21.5% 
1.5% have helped inform live investigations. Oh, That's I, one example. No, hold on, and for the 30 people who were injured and the others who were traumatised, we are so fortunate no one died mm. at past. I'm not oh, withstanding what they went through. Was, that. that would have been awful. It, oh, the, and the way he packed it, Michelle, you wanted to come no, back. No, I, I agree with you, but I still don't see. The investment, to me, needs to be going into counter-terrorism, um, into things like prevent. It doesn't need to be going into Bobby's on the beat. I think to it's not just Bobby's on the beat. It is the police. The thing. police force is yeah, highly yeah. under-resourced. Do you speak to any... I mean, Theresa May was seen to be really tough to be standing up to the police. Now we look back at it and we say, we've been negligent. We need our police force to be invested in, in terms of numbers, in terms of equipment, in terms of armed officers. We want to feel safe as citizens. We want our police to have that ability to protect us. Yeah. And, and they, they're being cut and cut and cut. And I think that is completely negligent. I and I have to lay down the law no, here right. because that's it for this week. But before we go, we've just got time for our straight talker of the week. Now, this week, the UK and the EU struck a deal on a post-Brexit transition period. But it turns out the EU is no fisherman's friend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Count them, folks. They dangled the bait of full market access to allow Britain's businesses to adjust to leaving. But there was a catch. In return, the EU will keep control of British waters until the end of... 2020. It's fair to say it hasn't landed well and Brexiteers <laughs> haven't been coy about their feelings. <laughs> Nigel Farage <laughs> felt that the best place to protest was, of course, on a boat on the Thames. What's here? Jumping. Spring what amazing. There it goes. Farage is now dumping fish in the Thames. Yeah. It's happening it's now live. It's absolutely tragic. Oh, what, a, what a waste. I mean, beautiful eating fish. And this is happening. You really can't hake this stuff up. So, for being characteristically reserved in making his point, Nigel Farage, you are our straight trawler of the week. Oh. It's, and that's it. All we've got time for. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs> Don't forget, you can join in the debate. Have you had a, enough yet? By searching for the pledge <laughs> on Facebook or Twitter. See you next time. Nigel Farage.